Good afternoon, everyone. Just giving a moment for folks to join up and we will get started in just a few seconds. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Karen Campbell, and I am Director of Community Initiatives and Policy at Canadian Women's Foundation. We're so pleased to welcome you all to this important session on disability justice and gender justice. Before I begin, um, I'd like to acknowledge that the work of the Canadian Women's Foundation and the programs that we support take place on traditional First Nations, Métis, and Inuit territories. And we are grateful for the opportunity to meet and work on this land. I'm logging on today from London, Ontario, the traditional territory of the Atawandaran, Anishinaabe, and Haudenosaunee peoples. The local First Nation communities of this area include the Chippewas of the Thames First Nation, the Oneida Nation of the Thames, and the Muncie Delaware Nation. We encourage you all to find out whose lands you live, work, and play on, and you can use the website native-land.ca to begin to find out the history of where you live. However, we recognize that land acknowledgements are not enough. We need to pursue truth, reconciliation, decolonization, and allyship in an ongoing effort to make right with all of our relations. We would also like to acknowledge that tomorrow marks the first ever National Day of Truth and Reconciliation. And we encourage particularly those of us on the call today who are settlers to take some time tomorrow to listen, learn and reflect on the legacy of residential schools and the ongoing colonization and genocide of First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples. Today, we are so very pleased to welcome you to our session on disability justice and gender justice. And we are most grateful to the Disabled Women's Network of Canada, Bonnie Brayton and her team who partnered with us to make the session a reality. To make our session run smoothly, I'd like to share a few housekeeping notes. In a few minutes, we will turn off Zoom's chat function to support those who are using screen readers. Instead, we are going to use an app called Slido to collect your questions and comments for our presenters. Uh, my colleague has just put that into the chat box now. Um, so please feel free to navigate over to that link um, to leave any comments or questions throughout the session. We're very happy to have simultaneous French and English interpretation today. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a small globe you can use that globe, to click on the globe, and then you will be able to choose English or French, whichever language you would like to listen to the webinar in. We also have English and French captions available. Um, and as you can see on your screen, ASL and LSQ interpretation. To see the English captions on screen, please click the button at the bottom of your screen that says live transcript, and then select show subtitles. If you would like to view French captioning, please use the link that is being put into the chat box now. We will have a short question and answer period at the end of the session, so please make sure to ask your questions and comments in Slido in the link that we provided. If we can't get to all of your questions on time today, we'll do our best to answer by email afterwards. And I'd also just like to note for you as well that our session today is being recorded and will be shared uh, afterwards. So with all of that said, I'd like to introduce you to the incredible women who are going to set the stage for us today and provide us with some really important information about ableism, the movement for disability justice, and how this links to our work towards gender justice in Canada and globally. We're going to begin with Melanie Marston, who is a Mohawk and Ojibwe woman from Bear Clan. Melanie is a social worker, a mother of three, and a grandmother, 
and she is a longtime activist, particularly on issues affecting people with disabilities and on gender-based violence. And Melanie is going to start us off with her reflections on the connections between disability justice and justice for Indigenous women. Welcome, Melanie. Language. Um, so as traditional um, Indigenous peoples are to uh, say where they are situated from. So Anne Sego, hello, my name is Melanie Marsden. Um, my Indigenous name is She Carries the Life Woman. I'm currently situated in Toronto or Tokoronto, which is uh, home to many um, Indigenous Inuit and Métis people, and traditionally the territory of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee peoples. Um, and many of the um, stories and such that I'm going to share are from the intersections of being blind or visually impaired, from a cisgender female woman, from a grandmother, and uh, from someone that's Indigenous that has had my culture stolen from me. So um, part of the reason that it's important to situate uh, who, who and where I am is because I don't look Indigenous. So, you know, some people do and some people don't. So when I say I'm registered with Alderville First Nations, that tells the audience that I have status. And unfortunately, because of colonialism, status is important. The number of things that I'm going to be making mention to um, do definitely uh, connect to racism, for sure. Um, and so I do encourage you to, um, you know, take a moment if, if some of the information I share is a bit heavy. Um, so my, um, my, um, my overall perspective is from my experience, as I said earlier, as a social worker for over 17 years, along with um, my experiences as growing up as a, as a child and, and so on. Um, how did I get there? How did I get to where I am at this moment? Um, I went to school in Brantford, Ontario for uh, people that are blind or visually impaired. In that school, I experienced many, many, many counts of racism. Um, I was told, you're not going to amount to anything. You know, many of us are told those stories. And when we're told those stories and when people use languages that are harmful, um, you carry that with you. The um, school was well aware of the family situation that I grew up in. Um, and I definitely wasn't middle class, right? So all those factors factor into these things. And when we're working with uh, agencies and our consumers, those things are in people's minds. And we need to start to think about the conversations of let's start planning programs and offering, offering um, grants and so on that come from the perspective of how can a grant be put together from a perspective where all peoples are included, regardless of if they're Indigenous or not. Moving forward, while I was in university, uh, taking my bachelor's degree in social work at Carleton University, things weren't as accessible as they are now, although it wasn't an easy task. And I was, at the same time, I was raising my children. I'm very fortunate to say that I didn't um, experience uh, Children's Aid Society. Um, however, I knew I had to be a um, safe, effective parent so that I wouldn't have to experience that barrier. But ableism today, then and now, still is as rampant as ever. Agencies didn't think at that time uh, that I could be a social worker. So as many of you may know, you have to have a practicum. So it was very difficult for me to find a practicum and many agencies didn't understand um, that I, there may be accommodations that I need and they didn't think I could be 
of a social worker like my counterparts, right, of colleagues. Um, so all the other people that I went to school with that I share in circle with, they all had placements and I didn't. It took a long time for me to find one, which was another barrier. For me, attitudinal barriers are one of the biggest barriers that people with disabilities face. And that is particularly because it's not something that you can prove necessarily. When I point it out to people, they would sort of say, well, I didn't, I didn't think about that. And then you move on. So the things that we need to do and start to put in place need to be things that happen every day, all the time, not just one-offs. Many of the advocacy skills that I've learned through the years, I would move those skills forward and take them to uh, employment opportunities that I would find. So it's important to understand that the leadership piece is around, um, I don't have, uh, many people with disabilities don't have the same opportunities that able-bodied people have in terms of seeking and finding meaningful employment. So it took me three years to find employment. I would use those advocacy skills to assist the participants that I'd work with over the years, for sure. For people with disabilities, um, you know, it, it not only takes long time, but it's also that um, I'm 57, I have no problem sharing that. I'm not in my career where I'd want to be. Um, it's uh, because of the multiple barriers that I've, I've uh, encountered. And some of that is um, rooted in ableism, obviously. It's also rooted in systemic racism. And then when you add the layer of being Indigenous and being robbed of your culture, it's like, what, what do I work on? What, how do I regain my, reclaim my voice as an Indigenous woman with a disability? How do I reclaim my voice as a social worker working in an Indigenous model, right? It's, it's, um, it's up to me to do that work. It's also um, adds another layer of complexity to that. Um, there's many forms of discrimination that I face, uh, and many people do. Uh, when you're filling out forms, um, it's getting a little bit better, but it's still, we can fill out the forms. It doesn't mean that we've actually put the information in the right boxes. So again, it's about how can we start to um, offer programs and services and applications that will include everyone from the get-go because that sends a very particular message. In the past, I have, I have coordinated many, many workshops, planned conferences, advocated for consumers. And during that time, many of the folks that I've worked with have experienced the barriers that I spoke about a few minutes ago, the discrimination. And it's, um, it's, it's that experience, when you have experienced that on a day-to-day, -day, it, it, it does uh, affect your spirit, right? So um, I smudged before, so that when I'm offering the words that I'm going to say, not only are they from the heart, but they're also um, that the seven generations that have come before me are here with me. So I'm not doing this work on my own. It, these are not just my words necessarily, right? They're, they're from generations of folks that have experienced um, uh, over racism time and time again. Unfortunately, our society is made up of systems that were put in place for able-bodied people, but not for people that have disabilities. We have to figure out how we can jump through the hoops that are put in place, right? Whether that's um, barriers with ODSP or inaccessible housing systems. Yet our desire to get an education and make something of our lives is similar to everyone else. So I encourage you to think about that. In closing, um, I, was, I had the opportunity to develop an Empowering Warriors program. Purpose of that program was 
to um, bring an elder into where I was working and the elder could direct us on our teachings and te teach us our teachings. And at the same time, um, teach us how someone with a physical disability that doesn't have um, dexterity could direct their attendant and still do tobacco ties, for example. So how to learn our teachings in an accessible way, because not only are the teachings lost and we have to and it's our responsibility to learn them again it's also about how can we have a sweat that's successful how can we smudge when you can't see so i use a barbecue lighter to smudge to to light my tobacco with so it's in a safe way right that booklet now um, is is because that organization folded um, the booklet that we put together from the purpose of that project is now just sitting in my computer. I haven't been able to get it printed and circulated. And it's it's a beautiful document because the ways in which the traditions and teachings were made accessible, one, it's only two or three, and two, it can't be distributed to anybody. So it's it's again lost. We need to get back to our roles. In, in terms of Indigenous people to keep us grounded in a good way. And we need to have uh, systems in place that let us do this in a meaningful way and, in, and where work is concerned in a meaningful work way. The experiences of systemic racism is having my Indigenous language and culture stolen from me from our colonialist state. And now it's my responsibility to learn it back again. So I took the opportunity and I'm currently reclaiming my voice by being enrolled in the Master of Social Work Indigenous Field of Study program at Wilfrid Laurier University. I, I am very um, happy and honored that uh, I've had a chance to speak today. I'm very honored that tomorrow many of us can really look at what truth and reconciliation is. I wish it were every day, not just one day, not just one day. So what are we going to do? What are we going to do tomorrow that can really start to honor Indigenous children who are the gifts, who, who will make our future? What are we going to do? I think of my granddaughter, who's two and a half, and it breaks my heart to think she could have been one of those children that were buried in which. Thank you so much, Melanie, for your words and for sharing your experiences and really grounding us and helping us to understand the impact that ableism has had on your life and in the life of your community. Um, we, we so much appreciate that. Um, I'd like us now to turn to uh, our next speaker, Valerie Grandmaison, who can help to make some connections between what, uh, what Melanie just shared and the history of um, the movement for disability justice in Canada. Valerie is a disabled feminist PhD student and community engaged researcher with the Live Work Well Research Center at the University of Guelph. She uses an intersectional approach and her research looks um, at the history, achievements, challenges and relationships of feminist disability organizations, um, particularly at addressing gender-based violence. So welcome Valerie, uh, thank you for being here today. Merci beaucoup, merci beaucoup. Um de m'avoir invité à cet événement très spécial. Euh, je remercie la Fondation canadienne des femmes de créer un espace euh, pour centrer les expériences, les connaissances, les compétences des femmes en situation de, de handicap au Canada. I want to begin by recognizing that I am a a uh, white settler 
from French ancestry on the ancestral lands of the Atherondon people and the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit. I live in Guelph, Ontario. I recognize the significance of the dish with one spoon component to this land and value my Anishinaabe, Adonasane, and Métis neighbor and their lineage. Recognize that we share land and responsibility for decolonization and healing in the present and in the future. Um, it's not really in the scope of this presentation today, but I really understand disability and gender through uh, the harm of colonialism and how colonialism continues to create impairments and put people in uh, conditions of disability um, and limit uh, the opportunities of a lot of people, especially indigenous people, racialized people. I'm grateful to Melanie for sharing her experiences. It gives life and vitality to what I study in books, um, the history of how women with disabilities, of um, indigenous women with disabilities come to recognize the barriers and fight against them. And as Melanie said, to reclaim their voice. So today I'm gonna trace a little bit of the history of the movement. Of the of disability of women with disabilities in Canada. It's important to know where we've been in order to come together to work towards uh, justice for all of us now and in the future. It was in the 1970s that a disability movement led by people with disabilities for people with disabilities that took place that started after World War II and uh, a lot of liberation movements around the world, more people were impaired and realized, were unsatisfied that disability services uh, were ran by people without disabilities. So they felt like their needs, their skills, their dreams were not considered uh, in these organizations. With the energy of other civil rights movement taking place at that time, and liberation movements around the world, they came together to advocate for their rights. Women with disabilities were part of the disability movement from the very beginning, um, but they faced barriers to achieve positions of decision making. So they were often in supporting roles or tokenistic, uh, like executive position. In fact, uh, women with disabilities at the time really felt unheard, really felt like the disability movement was not addressing issues in the lives of women with disabilities. And at the same time, in the 1970s, mainstream feminists um, were focusing on a very narrow vision of gender equality. So at that time, feminists, uh, they focus on achieving equality of rights under the law. Right? They wanted uh, men and women to be equal under the law and as well as have equal pay um, at work. But this really left out a lot of um, historically marginalized women, including uh, Black women, Indigenous women, racialized women who were already um, who already knew the impacts of a very racist and colonial legal system. So they they really believed that they couldn't actually gain equality through the just uh, the legal system. So the efforts of the women's movement, uh, it was clear for women with disabilities that their experiences of discrimination and the experiences in life were not recognized. But also women's a movement, women's events, women's information um, were not accessible to women with disabilities. So the women's movement sent a clear message to women with disabilities and said, you're not welcome. We are not making this accessible for you to, to even physically engage uh, with our information and our events. So with a feeling of being excluded from both the feminist and disability movement, Women with disabilities came together in Canada in the early 1980s to center the experiences of women with disabilities and advocate for their specific needs. In 1985, women with disabilities from across the country met at the 
Women with Disabilities Networking Meeting. That was the first time in Canada and maybe the world that women with disabilities from all across the country came together as women with disabilities to talk about issues and concern um, of women with disabilities. And that was organized by women with disabilities. That was very special. The women that organized it were Pat Israel from Toronto, Pat um, Danforth from Regina, and Mahil Bahil from Montreal. So by bringing women from all over the country, women with disabilities talk about their experiences of isolation, of medicalization, of poverty, and for many, institutionalization. They talked about the violence in their lives, the many forms that it took, and they realized that both the disability and women's movement was not addressing their needs. It is at that meeting um, that the first national organization representing the voice and concerns of women with disabilities was formed, the Disabled Women's Network of Canada that we all know uh, <laughs> yeah, as Dawn Canada. It also motivated the creation of local organizations of women with disabilities in urban centers and provinces, some that became um, Dawn chapters, regional Dawn chapters. It was said that the emergence of disabled well, Canada at the national, regional, and local level really marks the beginning of disabled women's movement in Canada. In 1989, already, Dawn Canada released a number of research papers written by women with disabilities about women with disabilities. That was probably the first time in Canada and in the world that they were, we, were we were taking charge of documenting what was happening in our lives um, because non-disabled people really uh, did harm to representing the lives of people with disabilities. So it is really important that was led by women with disabilities. These papers address issues of self-image, employment barriers, violence in the lives of women with disabilities and mothering. So Dawn Canada in this way was seen as world leaders on providing information about the lives of women with disabilities, which is still true today. I wanna to talk um, about intersectionality in the work of Dawn Canada. Given their experience of exclusion from both disability and women's movement, women with disabilities ground their work in intersectionality since the very beginning, right? Since the 1980s. And more than just an additive understanding of of double oppression when you're a woman and a person with disability. They understand that the experiences of women with disabilities, of diverse women with disabilities is, is specific, is different from each other. It's not only heightened discrimination and exclusion, but it's also specific type of exclusion of discrimination and also specific type of skills and knowledges that we have about the world. So, even from the beginning in 1985 at that meeting, um, invitations were specifically sent out to women of uh, diverse dis disability type, race, uh, geographical location. So from the very inception, it was about getting diverse voices and concern around the table. Dawn continues to reveal its commitment to uh, diverse women and girls with disabilities in its project and its research papers. It does more than providing an intersectional analysis, but it's also the way that they engage and build capacity and leadership for diverse women, including women of the Global South. They advocate for an intersectional approach to human rights, which should be translation into national and international commitments to collect, analyze data on the experience of diverse women with disabilities. It's about ensuring uh, consultation with diverse groups of women with disabilities, and to also recognize that there's gonna be specific recommendation for specific groups of women with disabilities. I just wanna end quickly by talking about the transnational engagement of Don Canada and the feminist disability movement in Canada. Don Canada has played a, a, a leading role in building a transnational, international network since its inception in 1985. For example, at the Disabled People's International Conference that was held in Bahamas in the 1985, in 19, 1985, 
women from Dawn brought together women from all over the world, from different countries. The meeting was simultaneously translated in five languages. You may imagine doing that without the technology that we have today. Together, they identified key concerns that they had and key knowledges and skills that different people had. Uh, and they devised a strategy for gender parity within the Disabled People's uh, International Organization. So to conclude, the work of feminist disability activism in Canada is led by Dog Canada for the last 30 years and emphasizes the importance of taking an intersectional approach, not only to address the different needs in our lives, but also to foster creative solutions towards justice. It is only when we come together in all that we all that, that we are, right, that we can hope to achieve gender and disability justice. Thank you very much. And that's it for me. Thank you so much, Valerie, um, for your excellent crash course in the history of the movement, which um, is, is so helpful in providing context for us. And it sets us up perfectly as well for our next speaker. Um, before I introduce Sarah, I'd just like to remind you that if you do have questions for our panelists, please use the Slido link that we provided um, and we can collect them up there. Um, so now we're turning to Sarah. Sarah Jama is an incredible young activist. She's the executive director at the Disability Justice Network of Ontario. She's a community organizer from Hamilton, Ontario with Cerebral Palsy. And Sarah's work combats anti-Black racism, policing and housing insecurity. Through the Disability Justice Network of Ontario, she's doing the important work of tackling systemic ableism by building the capacity of other young community organizers who are living with disabilities. And all together, they are working to challenge the structures locally, provincially, and nationally that um, that need to be to be taken down. So we're so appreciative of your time uh, today, Sarah, and uh, uh, to learning from you about how calls for disability justice are tied to the movement for gender justice and for racial justice. So welcome to you. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. Can you hear me OK? All right, so my name is Sarah and as I was introduced, I'm based in Hamilton, Ontario at the Disability Justice Network of Ontario. Uh, we picked Hamilton as our home base because Hamilton has the largest density of disabled people across Ontario. Before I begin, I kind of want to tell a little bit of a story and forgive me if I get emotional. Uh, this is not only one of my first times speaking in a long while since the start of this year, but also it's the first time that I'm really kind of telling this story. So I'm gonna go back to the early 80s um, and introduce you to someone named Amun. Amun was 19, living in Kenya, uh, Nairobi, and was about to be given off into an arranged marriage. And to, to get away from the arranged marriage situation, um, she decided to elope with a man similar to her age, who she didn't know so well, but he promised that he would get her out of the country, um, come to Canada, where they would be able to get jobs, she could go to school, and they could support their families back home. She wasn't really allowed to go to school, her dad didn't really want her to, and so she saw this as an opportunity to live the life that she always wanted, so she eloped, moved to Canada with this person who was relatively a stranger, and at 19, found herself in an extremely abusive relationship with someone with a multitude of invisible disabilities that neither of them knew about or knew how to handle. Um, there were times where he would come home hearing voices and the voices, the voices would um, instruct him to do terrible things. And so on numerous occasions, she was isolated, um, almost beaten to death and almost died. Um, by the time she was pregnant with her last child, um, there was an incident of violence so extreme that it caused her to be bedridden at her first trimester. Uh, doctors tried to get her to abort this fetus. They said that this baby would be a vegetable, wouldn't move, walk, talk, or eat on its own. And she said, no, I don't want to. 
not really fully understanding the medical systems here, not really fully understanding how she was being interacted with as a young black woman in the medical system. She fought to be able to keep the pregnancy and was bedridden until uh, the end of the second trimester. Uh, despite all odds, she gave birth. Um, this baby actually died at birth and was revived um, on multiple occasions. And um, despite all odds, was able to uh, continue living. And then I was born, right? So throughout my life, I grew up on social assistance and in and out of domestic violence shelter situations. And though I understood violence and poverty and houselessness on an intimate level, I didn't really understand the structures behind what I was experiencing. I didn't understand why my father was struggling to access mental health supports that he needed. I didn't understand why we were making money on OW, but it wasn't enough to actually pay proper living situations. I didn't understand why, even though it was difficult for me to make it upstairs or to do you know, to live or take showers on my own without supports or without bath bars, why it was so difficult to find accessible environments. I didn't really understand that a lot of what we were experiencing was structural. As most kids did, I internalized a lot of my experiences as being my fault. Um, until I got to grade 11 or 12 and I met someone else who was in a wheelchair and who had disabilities. And he came up to me and kind of said something like, you know, I want to be an actor when I grow up and I wanted to go to this special art school, but it wasn't accessible. And after all I had been through, I don't know why this was the thing that got to me, but I was like, how dare um, this school, the Etobicoke School of the Arts not be accessible? How dare this kid couldn't apply to go to this school just because he was in a wheelchair? For me, that was the first time being able to see someone else's experience outside of mine in a structural way. Um, and I, I got really upset. And so I found myself as a young teenager getting on a bus downtown to go and try to delegate in front of the special education advisory committee uh, to tell a bunch of people, oh, you should make this school accessible, thinking that they would listen, thinking that, you know, maybe they didn't understand uh, why young kids should have the right to go to acting school. So I show up at this committee meeting. I'm not on the agenda. I don't know. I don't really understand policy or how these things work. I just show up to the meeting expecting to be able to talk. And I remember rolling in and there was a U-shaped table filled with white men, most who didn't have disabilities themselves, but were parents of people with disabilities, um, making decisions and all were dressed up fancy in this boardroom on at this boardroom table and the chair of the board at the time Chris Bolton I still remember his name he laughed at me when I came in and he said who do you think you are to be able to come here and to speak on an issue when you it's not like you represent every student with a disability and it's not like George actually applied to this school so it doesn't matter if he wanted to go and it doesn't matter that it didn't have an elevator and he laughed and he thought it was funny that I didn't understand procedure. And for me, that was the first time really understanding structural ableism, you know, understanding how I was being read as a young black woman and understanding the personification of power around this table. And I thought to myself, you know, I, I had experienced a lot of trauma on my own, but if, if I were to encounter the personification of power in that way again, structural ableism, structural racism, I would do something about it. And throughout school, I was able to create, when I went to post-secondary, uh, MACSES, which is a student-led organization for students with disabilities, by students with disabilities, to learn self-advocacy. And I really got to understand that though there were many services out there that help and support young people with disabilities, no one was really teaching us the, the skills of, you know, what do you do? Where do you go when the services in place don't work for you? And I, I thought back to, you know, shelter systems, how a lot of the shelters I like lived through, went through, weren't accessible, right? How we didn't have the language in our family to unpack intergenerational trauma and violence. How many of the services that existed didn't exist on the accesses that we needed in order to to get through a lot of what we've endured. And so I found myself taking, learning about direct action, 
right? How do you actually take power into your own hands to force change? I learned to block traffic. I learned to do sit-ins. I learned to teach other people and other disabled people how to organize and disrupt systems of power. But these spaces that I was in, spaces of womanism, spaces of black power, weren't always accessible. And so I had to take a step back and think about what was missing. What was missing was a lens of disability justice. And I, I use this opportunity to teach myself the difference between disability justice and accessibility. Accessibility is the this idea, this false idea of inclusivity, that if you add a ramp to a store um, to increase our economic purchasing power, disabled people would be included. If you make the military more accessible and inclusive to disabled people, that you're actually bettering the lives of disabled people. Disability justice exists to disrupt that. Disability justice is anti-capitalist and it's a way of looking at how you know, race, gender, and disability intersect, in my opinion, to challenge power. It's not just about rebuilding a world that fits us, but it's allowing us to answer the question, what do we do if the world that exists doesn't fit us? And how do we rebuild a new one? I started learning about you know, the links between ableism and colonialism over time that the transatlantic slave trade was created on the basis of othering the black mind and the black body by framing black people as other, as incompetent and not human. I learned about the diagnosing of black people as having mental illnesses when seeking freedom called drapedomania. So slaves that would run away were diagnosed as unwell. I learned about the medical industrial complex throughout history and how in Canada and in the States, sterilization was used and weaponized against women of color and women with disabilities. I learned about the Alberta Sterilization Act and the links, the links between these structures and these structural decisions around eugenics that were based off of Nazi Germany and how these structural decisions such as the Alberta Sterilization Act were targeted against indigenous women and people of color. I learned about how people with disabilities, particularly women, were locked away, were sent to you know, institutions like the Aurelia Asylum for the Idiots and the Feeble Minded, and how people with disabilities were forcibly institutionalized against their will. I learned about today and how we can see structural ableism through funding and how the prenatal screening of Down syndrome has more investment nationally than the funding of the adult lives of people with Down syndrome. And don't get me wrong, I am pro-choice, but when you have governments making decisions in terms of investments, in terms of who gets to live and who gets to die, that is not a choice, that is funded structural ableism. And I know that because that too was my life. Before I even was born, you know, you had people looking at my mom saying, oh, this woman is going to be in deep poverty. She's not going to be able to handle a disabled child who will be a burden on the state. That is the language that they use, even though she fully didn't understand it at the time. So I, I also started to learn about police violence and the killings of Abdi Rahman Abdi, an autistic Somali man, I'm Somali as well, who was killed simply because of a noise complaint in Ottawa, about Solomon Fakiri, a Muslim man in Lindsay, Ontario, who was beaten to death by prison guards he had schizophrenia and two was arrested due to something around a noise complaint. And Andrew Lopu and so many others who had mental illnesses who were black or people of color. I'm thinking about Regis Paquette who was killed on a mental health call and so many other women. I'm thinking about Joyce Echequan, you know, somebody who recorded herself an indigenous woman minutes before she died and during medical racism. To me, disability justice and gender justice are linked because it teaches us to look at the accesses of power, not just oppression, not just my individual experiences and trauma, but how do the accesses and power intersect to say that certain people get to live and certain people do not. Another modern day example of this intersection is looking at you know, the recent um, expansion of medical assistance in dying, which we did a lot of work around at the Disability Justice Network of Ontario. What you had was a rushed decision by people in positions of power to expand medical assistance in dying in Canada to include disabled people who were not terminally ill. And the problem with this expansion was that it was saying that if you are disabled, you have the right to choose to die simply for being disabled. It, 
the, the language of inclusivity was being used to prop up this eugenics-based bill in the sense that it wasn't being offered to everybody. Not everybody has the right to state-assisted suicide, but only those with disabilities because disabled lives are harder to live in the eyes of people passing this legislation. And so we see within that many people in the last couple of years, particularly women, have spoken up to say, I am going to access medical assistance in dying because I'm living in extreme poverty, because it can take two years to access a, a pain clinic in London, Ontario, because we don't have access to fully funded free medication in this country, because we don't have access to fully funded um, assistive devices in this country, because if you are also an injured worker, um, you don't have access to the same rights as everybody else. You're not covered under the Canada Health Act. If you are not able to be deemed as productive in the way the state wants you to, if you are seen as disabled, then you are disposable. And that impacts women at a disproportionate rate. It's women who are most likely to end up institutionalized or single or in intimate partner violence situations if you're disabled. We know that 83% of disabled women in Canada are likely to experience sexual assault at least once in their lifetimes. And we know that people with disabilities are two times more likely to experience violence overall. And these legislations are saying, yeah, instead of giving you support to live, we will give you supports to die. And if that's not eugenics, I don't know what is. I think in, in order to in order to make sure as you know, funders and people who care about wanting to talk about feminism and gender justice, we also need to be talking about disabled women and those who are the most marginalized in these communities. Um, women also have a harder time in our child welfare systems and we don't talk about it as well. A mentor of mine who's passed away, Ing Wong Ward, the first thing she told me when I asked about her life as a parent um, to the most beautiful eight-year-old daughter that I've ever seen, she said, Sarah, don't have a child unless you can afford the lawsuits, the lawyers that you'll need. Because as soon as you give birth, um, CAS will be called and you will be questioned in terms of your capacity. And it doesn't matter if you have an able-bodied partner at all. They will still try to say that you are unfit. And so we need to have an examination in terms of you know, how women are treated by every single form of institution that is out there. Because we're not talking about the child welfare system in relation to disabled women. We're not talking about long-term care homes enough and how women end up in long-term care homes once you're not able to, to be seen as functioning or um, able to live alone, right? We need to be talking about funding home care as much as we're talking about other services that need funding. We talk a lot about child care but the same people talking about childcare should be talking about home care, should be saying that we have the right to access medical services outside of hospitals. Because if we don't, we're gonna see what we continue to see during the course of this pandemic, which was governments on all levels rolling back rights and decisions, right? We had the triage protocol, which basically said that if you are disabled, you have lesser rights in terms of accessing supports in an emergency. You will be triaged, you will be served after able-bodied people because you are less likely if you have comorbidities according to this piece of legislation in Ontario to survive and to be able to, you, you are less worth the access to supports in medical institutions. And we also saw this with the rollback of the Healthcare Consent Act, which said that, you know, doctors could make decisions for you without consent of yourself or your family during this pandemic. If we're not prioritizing, you know, how women are treated by these institutions, it's not enough to say, we just, we need childcare. We're gonna applaud this government for $10 a day childcare plans. We need to be talking about the lives of women who are intersecting with all of these institutions. Um, one of the last things I'll say is that if you are involved in a women's based organization, it's important to center the voices of those who are the most marginalized. I get asked to public speak a lot, but I also don't represent everybody's experiences. Learn about and hear from the people that make you the most uncomfortable. Learn about and hear from the people that take more work for you to understand. It's easy for me to get up and speak because I'm seen as palatable um, when I talk. 
but learn about the experiences that I might not be able to speak to. Learn about what women are going through who are disabled in our carceral systems and women who are struggling to get through our you know, school experiences and start talking to children at a younger age about violence and domestic violence, especially if they are disabled. I know that for me, I was given a pass like a lot of other women through gym class, which means that we didn't get the same experience around sexual health and understanding that a lot of other young women did growing up in school. I missed a lot of content and I'm not the only one. And it's because I was treated as, you know, not worthy of the information. So I had to do a lot of learning like many of us do. And this is studied through Can Child Disability here in Hamilton, but also through the Holland Blurview Kids Rehab Hospital. They've done a lot of studies on this where women and young girls with disabilities will learn about sexual health and things like intimate partner violence and the risks um, in their late 20s and early 30s, much later than a lot of other young people in our school systems. I think we are failing our kids. We're putting them in extreme risky situations because we're not giving them proper access to education and we're not taking our advocacy to intersectional levels that we need to in order to protect women from being abused through medical racism or ending up in our long-term care home situations. It's not enough to just talk about childcare or equal pay because these conversations are privileged. It's a privilege to have children. It's a privilege to be able to work. But what about those who cannot? they still have the right to exist. And how are we supporting them as well? Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah, for that really powerful presentation. Um, and particularly for sharing your story and for lifting up the stories of uh, those whose lives have been affected and even ended um, as a result of ableism and the other intersecting oppressions and the enactment of power that you talked about. Um, I think that was um, very powerful um, what you shared. So thank you so much for, for doing that for us. Um, and I can see that reflected in some of the comments that are coming in as well with many, many thanks to you for that. We uh, can still collect up some questions on Slido. I, I know that we are running short on time in this plenary, but I'd like to extend it a little bit if, uh, if we can uh, to give an opportunity. First of all, um, maybe to, uh, I'll invite Melanie and Valerie as well uh, back into the mix here of our, our three presenters. Um, and I wonder, first of all, if Valerie or Melanie or Sarah, if there was anything that you heard in each other's presentations that you wanted to ask questions about or comment on uh, or, or reinforce? Uh, is there anything that you wanted to comment on first? I'll, I'll provide that opportunity. Okay, maybe I will kick it off then uh, with a question. Sarah, at the end of your presentation, you started talking about um, some sort of calls to action, not for uh, just for direct service providers, but I think for the feminist movement uh, more generally. You talked about centering the voices of those who are the most marginalized. You talked about engaging kids at a younger age. You talked about um, making our advocacy more intersectional and stronger. Um, I wonder if there are any other um, calls to action that you have, particularly thinking about the folks who are on this webinar today, most of whom are direct service providers. And I'll ask this to you and to Valerie and to Melanie, is are there one or two things that you would like the folks here today to think about um, or to, to have as a takeaway um, from from this conversation. Um, one thing that I didn't get too much into is like the, the housing crisis. So here on the ground, we, we spend a lot of our time giving out like tents, food supports, doing delivery. We fed over 7,000 people on our own through the, like, through the course of this pandemic. Uh, we, we end up a lot supporting folks in encampments who are houseless. And most of them are disabled. Uh, folks who have fallen through the cracks of other services. In Hamilton, we've had people banned from shelters 
like domestic violence shelters as well, because they were seen as disruptive. Because when you enter these systems, you're expected to not use substances. You're expected to alter the way that your body is used to functioning in order to fit the rules of you know these systems in these places to be worthy of supports. But that too is a form of ableism, right? Expecting people, young women, to change how their body functions in order to access supports in these places. And so they end up houseless because they're kicked out of the shelters or vans, um, end up on the street, and then back in the shelter because they're kicked out of the parks, and then it's the cycle. And so how can we as frontline workers, service providers, get into the nitty gritty of these types of conversations. Um, there actually is, and we looked into it in Hamilton, there is no accessibility policy outside of AOTA, the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act for shelter systems, for example. The Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act is not detailed enough to talk about this type of ableism, right? The, the type of ableism that people are experiencing that's causing them to be in encampments. It's built to around consumerism. It's built specifically for the function of allowing disabled people to like operate and spend money in our society and stores. So how can we talk about accessibility policy, whether it's through our shelter systems or it's through whatever nonprofits you work at, create nuanced accessibility policy that's built with people that you work for in mind outside of AOTA? How do we go beyond the limits of current legislation? None of us are really taught to do that. None of us are taught to ask if we can do that. And so one of the questions I always go back to is, what do you do if the services in place, if the structures in place don't work for you? How can you implement that question in your places of work to create policy that actually works for the young women that you wanna support? Because what we have that exists is the bare minimum. I, I just think what Sarah said is absolutely fantastic and really the core of it. And I also just want to add to that, that. Uh, Diverse women with disabilities know, are experts in the situations in their lives. They know what accessibility means, what inclusion means, what justice means for them. So please include them when making decisions. Please include them when thinking about how your services can be improved because they can help in, in, in uh, identify specifically what needs to be done. So thank you. And I think um, it's Melanie speaking, if I can just add to all the comments that have been made so far, um, and thank you to the other panelists. Um, for me, it's also about relationship building, right? Um, you're asking, you're, you're, you're needing to listen to women with disabilities and know that they are the expert. And you need to honor them as you're building that relationship, right? So it's not just taking our information and letting us help you build policies that are going to be uh, inclusive for all peoples. It's about building the relationship. Uh, I believe that's really fundamental because of, uh, well, I could go on and on, but I'm just going to add the relationship building piece. Thanks very much. Um, I do have a question from uh, somebody in the audience who um, is saying that, and, and I think quite rightly pointing out that this um, conflation of accessibility and disability justice is very common. And we're wondering if you can say something uh, more about this distinction to really help us to understand it and to maybe suggest um, how that can translate into actual um, program development um, for or direct service provision. Um, how, how can that be that disability justice lens be reflected better there? Um, I think a lot of people have different definitions of disability justice, but it was created by Sins and Ballad, so an art like an artist based collective in uh, San Francisco of queer, Black, racialized artists uh, who are disabled. And I, the, the cool thing about this term is it's not yet been co-opted by ac academia. It, like, I think it's on the brink of being co-opted, but not yet. And so that's why you have so many different cool takes on it. The way I look about at accessibility is that it's like, it's been liberalized. It was created to mean including disabled people by like changing your immediate environments to to allow disabled people to access your spaces and thus making it accessible. But what it's turned into is this like neoliberal way of uh, 
Stacey Milburn came up with this term access washing, where you'll have like people in positions of power and policymakers say they're causing harm, but it's accessible harm. And therefore it's including disabled people. And that moves away from the initial intent of including disabled people in your immediate environment. So an example of that is like here locally in Hamilton, you have uh, local officials saying they're clearing tents of disabled people uh, to make parks more accessible and these disabled people don't have anywhere to go. So they're using the term access uh, to perpetuate more harm against disabled people while not actually building a world that is accessible in, in its true term. Whereas disability justice looks at like the intersecting systems that cause harm, our car carceral system, our education systems, our medical systems to ask the questions of like, okay, how do we rebuild? How do we dismantle this and rebuild this uh, to actually fit disabled people. And disability justice, as Sins and Valid made it, is a philosophy. They have like 10 principles, but it's not really yet been actioned, right? And so I think that was the intent behind creating the Disability Justice Network of Ontario. How do you get young people equipped to challenge systems as they currently are and have the tools to rebuild spaces that fit them? And to me, that's what disability justice is, but it might not be everyone's definition. We took we try to like take their principles and figure out okay, how do you actually create a framework around it? Great. Thank you. Valerie or Melanie, did you want to comment on that or um I'll just take one uh I first of all I agree with what Sarah has said for sure. Um I think it's also around are the actions that your organizations are doing being done in a social justice way, right? So when I mentioned earlier, when I'm organizing events or conferences or what have you, I don't, I don't do it from the perspective of, is there a ramp, right? I, I, I take into consideration as much as I possibly can so that folks that have intellectual disabilities of folks that may have literacy issues, folks that may identify as deaf. Um, it, I make sure that whatever I'm doing, that it's it's true inclusion by what I mean, which is encompasses the intersectionality piece. Plus, I do it with a committee so that it's done by and for us. Um, especially, yeah, so I just want to um, flush that out. I think there's probably a little bit of work that would need to be done um, for people to get there, but those are the things that I would be thinking about. And also um, offering um, others employment in terms of, okay, let's ensure that we're hiring people and doing best practices um, and ensuring that not just the hiring piece, but that um, you're not just taking our information, people, our organizations aren't taking our information and, and just using it, right? You're, you're putting action to the words that you want to um, stand for. And it shows a clear message for all other organizations and agencies and funders. Thanks. Uh, Valerie, anything to add? I really think that Melanie and Sarah did a really good job at it. And the, the way, just the way to see it is like exist, accessibility may not challenge the structures that are inherently ableist and racist. As for disability justice would look at how um, these structures, as Sarah talked about, really um, put barriers and disadvantage for people with disabilities. So, that's the difference that I see between the two. So accessibility is like a band-aid, a little, like it's the maybe the bare minimum, right? Great, thank you so much, everyone. Um, this discussion is really rich and there's so much more that we could say. Um, we are, however, at the end of our time for this, uh, for this segment of our event. Um, so I would first like to 
again, uh, express our deep appreciation to all three of you for, for sharing your knowledge and experience and stories with our group. Um, you've set us up very well for the discussions that will follow in the next uh, 45 minutes to hour. Um, so as you know, the next piece of this event is that we will split up into small group discussions. One will focus on disability and gender-based violence, one on disability justice and youth, and one on disability and economic security. Um, participants on the call, you should have received an email this morning with a link to your breakout session, but if not, we're briefly going to enable the chat and uh, put the links into each of those sessions and panelists, you're welcome to join any of these uh, discussions as well. Um, and we'll try to start those sessions at 1.15 to give people time to transition over and maybe take a bit of a stretch break or uh, uh, whatever you need. Um, since we won't be joining together again in a plenary session, I'd like to close our session out here today by um, again thanking our panelists for everything that you've shared. But also I'd like to recognize Bonnie Brayton and her team at Dawn Canada, Tamara, Kanitha and Mackenzie for all of the support that they provided uh, to the foundation in making this session happen today. I'd also really like to thank our uh, incredible teams of French, English and ASL LSQ interpreters and our captioners who have been uh, typing rapidly in English and French uh, to make sure that this event is as accessible as possible. So thank you so much for that. And thank you um, to some folks on my team, particularly Michelle Macindo um, and others who are running everything that you see today in the background. You all are amazing and thank you uh, for, for making this, this possible. And to all of you who are participating with us today, we really look forward to picking up the conversation in your breakout rooms in a few minutes, and then as an ongoing conversation as part of our engagement with you as organizations that we fund. So thank you, thank you to everyone, and we will see you at 1.15 in your breakout rooms. Bye everyone. Thank you, thank you.